you, Richard. Well, good morning, everyone. And good morning to everyone that's watching and listening online. Today, I will start a series which I think could quite rightly be termed, termed Return to the Land. Barry finished talking about the kings of Judah. And the kings of Judah, they were taken off to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah had predicted that there would be a 70-year period. And that's true if it's taken from the first exodus from Jerusalem. If it's taken from the third, it was actually only 51 years. So it depends a little bit on who got taken away when, but we'll cover that as well. And as you can see from up there, there's quite a list of things to cover, but I'd like to open with Psalm 71, verses 14, 15, and 16. Psalm 71, verses 14, 15, and 16. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your wondrous deeds and your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness and thine alone. Now that'll give you some idea of how I felt when I started to put this together. How do I talk of all the wondrous deeds of God? Then when you go through the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in particular, you will see the wondrous deeds of God and how God responded to the prayers of the leaders and of the people from time to time and the wondrous deeds he performed and sometimes the strange ways in which it happened. Actually, Daniel 9, verses 1 to 19, there's no need to turn there, has Daniel's prayer for God's forgiveness and the release of Israel from exile. And it talks there about the first year of Darius the Mede. But actually the series begins with the first year of Cyrus the Persian and the decree allowing the exiles to return. And it's the same year. So how can we have Darius and Cyrus in the same year? And the answer is not so much in, uh, in the scripture. The answer comes from the Persian records. Cyrus was the king and he appointed a vice regent in Susa, whose name was Gorbys or some name like that. G-O-R-B-Y-S, I think it was. And he became known to the Jews as Darius I. But he's not Darius I. Darius I actually follows on from Cyrus. <clears throat> the book of Ezra describes the first wave of the return to the land in 537-538 BC under Zerubbabel. And you get the rebuilding of the temple between the time of his return and 516 BC amid fierce opposition. The second wave of return comes under Ezra in 458 BC. And then the book of Nehemiah describes the building of the walls of Jerusalem in 444 BC, the restoration of public worship, and the later, later duties of Nehemiah as governor from around about 432 BC. 
This is just a quick overview. Both books, Ezra and Nehemiah, have extensive genealogies, and they equate with First Chronicles chapters one to nine, which were used to re-establish the Levitical priesthood and the Davidic royal line. No more kings, but that didn't mean that the royal line had been disrupted. It still existed through Jeconiah, who was taken off to Babylon, and Barry mentioned that last week. You'll see how it fits in. The book of Esther is set in Susa, a royal city in Persia, between 483 and 460 BC. And like Joseph in Egypt, Esther becomes a member of a foreign court and is used by God to protect and preserve his people. And integrated through all of that, we have the prophets Daniel, Joel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so our Old Testament closes with Malachi. And uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are often referred to quite correctly as the post exilic prophets and this is interesting jewish tradition and i say that's what it is jewish tradition credits ezra with writing first and second chronicles the book that bears his name parts of nehemiah and he's also credited with being the author of psalm 1 psalm 107 and Psalm 119. And when you realize that uh, Ezra was very skilled in the law of Moses, was a great scribe and a great teacher, you can understand when you read Psalm 119, which I know you will all read in five minutes when you go home, <laughs> you can see the teacher of the Mosaic law going through that. So I have no doubt that they're correct. Now, if this thing is still working, we come up, there's two exiles. The first exile was Israel. The 10 tribes were taken away by Assyria in 721. There's a tendency today to talk about the lost tribes of Israel. They're not lost at all. They know who they are, and the Lord knows who they are. And they tended to filter back after uh, Ezra and Nehemiah had settled everything up again. Some of the others from Assyria tended to filter back. So the tribes were there, but just not the way they had been before Assyria. The second exile was Judah. That was the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And Nabod, uh, they were taken to Babylon, the third one in 586 BC. There were three deportations from Judah, all by Nebuchadnezzar and all to Babylon. The first one in 606 was the court and the nobles. And that's when Daniel was taken off because he was of the nobility of the court although he was probably in his early teens at that stage. The second one was in 597. They were the craftsmen. And that's when Ezekiel got nicked and taken off to Babylon. And then the commoners were taken in 586. And that was more than anything to prevent a rebellion back in Judah. You see, you take the leaders away first. That reduces the, the possibilities of rebellion. Then you take the craftsmen and they can't build their walls and they can't make weapons and all that sort of stuff. And then you think there's still too many of them there. So you take a, a large lump of them away as well. So actually Babylon had a very significant Jewish presence. And then we have three returns from Persia or, and Babylon. Zerubbabel in 537, 538, under the decree by Cyrus, 
And there were approximately 50,000 that came back. <clears throat> Ezra, in 458 BC, Darius, Darius I and Artaxerxes was also there. He only had about 1,800. But those 1,800 were priests and Levites. It was to reestablish the religion. Zerubbabel was to build the temple. That was his commission. Ezra was to restore the religion with the priests and the others. And incidentally, Zerubbabel, with the 50-odd thousand, he actually had a military escort as well. Ezra did not have a military escort because he said to the king, God will protect us. And here we've got this relatively small group, 1,800. We think it's a lot of people, but it's a small group when you start thinking about the armies that could have attacked. And they're carrying all the temple gold and plates and all the temple treasures. What a target. But God protected them. And in fact, Zerubbabel took five months to get to Jerusalem because they went around the top through the Fertile Crescent. Ezra and his crew, they went straight across the deserts. It only took them three months to get there. God provided. And then Nehemiah in 444 BC went back and Artaxerxes is involved very much there in the rebuilding of the walls and a few decrees. And then the 10 tribes drift back later. Now in there are phases of return in each book and the, it covers a period of about 110 years. Ezra chapters one and two deal with the first return by Zerubbabel. Three and six, the rebuilding of the altar and the temple. Then chapters seven and eight is the second return under Ezra himself. And that was nine and 10 talk about the reform that was to take place. Nehemiah, Chapters 1 and 2 talk about the third return. Chapters 3 to 7 talk about the rebuilding of the walls. Chapters 8 to 10 talk about a renewal of faith. And 11 to 13 talk about the reform and going back to, back to basics, essentially. And it's interesting that chapter 9 in each of the books contains a lengthy prayer of confession. And that confession is by Ezra in his book, Nehemiah in his, and it's a confession on behalf of the people. To say, you know, Lord, we have sinned, moved away from you, forgive us. He's praying for the nation. Then we have the connected books. Joel, the dates are uncertain. Some scholars put Joel back round 850 BC. Others put him just before Ezra and Nehemiah. He's not a post-exilic prophet. He's the last of the pre-existing, <laughs> pre-exile prophets, if you like, in their view. And you'll see why in a minute. Then we've got uh, Ezra and the dates there concerned and Cyrus and Xerxes and Artaxerxes were the kings. Esther is in the middle of it all. That's uh, Xerxes the first, who is referred to by the Jews as Ahasuerus. Nehemiah under Artaxerxes the first. Haggai is about 520. Zechariah. 520 to 475, he was a much younger man. Um, Haggai was quite an old man when he started to prophesy, and all of his prophecies are in one year, four of them. 
in 520 BC. And then we have Malachi approximately 440 BC. Uh, that date might be a little bit flexible. The point with Malachi, he is still talking in Persian language. The names that he uses for governors and all that sort of stuff is Persian. It's not Greek. Because when Alexander uh, took over, corporate takeover, a hostile takeover of the uh, Persian Empire of Medes and Persians, and then uh, he fell off the perch at a very young age and his generals divided up the Alexandrian kingdom and the Ptolemies took Egypt and the Seleucids took a large lump of mostly the Middle East, but particularly Syria and Israel and that area there. And uh, that's when you get Antiochus and he comes in and slaughters pigs on the temple and so the Maccabee uprising and all that stuff. Malachi was before that because he's still using Persian terms for the various leaders. Okay, so what's the message of Joel? The message of Joel can be summarized in three simple statements. Calamities are God's warning of judgment to come. Heed these warnings and return to God with all your heart. And when you return to God, God's fullest blessings will be poured out on you and on all people. God judges sin. God demands full commitment. God blesses those who commit themselves to him. Now that's the, I suppose you can say, my summary of the message of Joel. If you go into the book of Joel by itself, that, that's quite a good study of its own. But you can see there, or you will see, how that uh, summary of Joel's message fits with Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're talking about the same thing. Okay, so let's start looking at the book of Ezra. Taken as a whole, the 800 years occupancy of Canaan by God's covenant people is a woeful story. Toward the end, it becomes perhaps the most tragic national record ever written. You see in the history of Israel, a high calling and deep sinning. High privilege and the abuse of it. You'll see that exile was the only answer. God told them, if it, back through Moses in Deuteronomy, you play up and walk away from me and I'll kick you out of the land. It's my land. I give you the right to live in it. You don't stay committed to me. You'll go into exile. And he did. See, what God says, he means. He means what he says because he says what he means. And he will do what he says he will do. Through it all, however, Israel was cured of idolatry once and for all. There is no record of any idolatry of any sort in Israel. When I'm talking about idolatry, I'm talking about false gods and all that sort of stuff. After the exile, they had learnt their lesson, but they did fall into the idolatry of materialism and things of that nature and religion. They had also learned of God's faithfulness. They learned that there was a future. While the Davidic throne was no more, the Davidic line of the Messiah still existed. And they learned that Jehovah was with them in the present. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 5, we read, According to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, 
so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. That's interesting. Do not fear or fear not. You know, it appears 366 times in the scripture. There's one there even for leap year. 366 times the Lord says to his people, fear not, or as we like it in our more modern translation, do not fear or don't be frightened. Fear not, for the Lord your God is with you. A new chapter began in 538 when the remnant returned to Judea. And the book of Ezra tells that story. They return in two stages. The first year of Cyrus tells of that span some 23 years from the edict of Cyrus to rebuild the temple until its completion. And that was led by Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest. And then 80 years later, you actually get the group led by Ezra. That's why the book of Ezra is sort of in two parts in that sense. So the book of Ezra, Ezra itself develops a number of themes. <clears throat> it affirmed the belief of the people of Judah who returned that one day God would establish the nation again and set up a promised glorious kingdom. It emphasized the importance of rebuilding the temple so that God might be worshipped according to the law. Ezra also expressed the importance of commitment and called for reform of a people who wish to claim God's covenant promises. And of course, like all books of the Bible, it has a structure, a very deliberate structure. The return under Zerubbabel is chapters 1 to 6. The proclamation and provision of Cyrus is chapter 1. The census of the return, chapter 2, verses 1 to 67. The offerings of the people. These are the people who are in uh, Babylon. Other Jews who didn't want to go back, but they said, well, that's okay. You can go back if you want to. We're happy here, but here we make some offerings to you to help you on your way. And then chapters 3 through to 6 are the building of the temple. Chapters 7 to 10 are the return under Ezra. 7 is the commission and the gifts of Artaxerxes. Then chapter 8, 1 to 20 is the census of the return. There's a lot of that, a lot of the census through both these books and also through Chronicles. And it's all there for the purpose of re-establishing the tribes, the priesthood, and the messianic line, the kingly line. Chapter 8, 21 to 36 is the journey and the delivery of the treasure. And chapters 9 and 10, I've just called it Ezra and Null's Strange Marriages. We'll get to that in more detail. Now in Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom <clears throat> and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven, has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah who is among you of all his people may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel he is God which is in Jerusalem and whoever is left in any place where he dwells let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, beside the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. 
<clears throat> Interesting. Did you note in that, in the proclamation, that Cyrus refers to the Lord God of Israel as the God? And then, in parenthesis, he is God. Why? He'd come to recognize Jehovah as the supreme God. Why? Well, in the book of Daniel, we read of the demise of the Babylonian king and the capture of the kingdom by Darius the Mede, actually Cyrus the Persian. In a very short time, Darius appointed Daniel as governor over the whole kingdom. So he was the number two man. Remember, this is Darius. These are the Persians, and they've appointed Daniel as the number two man. According to Persian records, this Darius, yeah, there he is. I knew I had it somewhere. Gobris, G-O-B-Y-R-S, was appointed by Cyrus as viceroy, but Cyrus was the king. Daniel 6.28 says, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Still doesn't tell us how the heart of Cyrus was stirred up by the Lord. Well, if we go to Isaiah 44.28 and 45.1, we don't have to turn there. You see that Isaiah had prophesied a couple of hundred years earlier by name, Cyrus, my servant, will do this. Cyrus, my chosen one, will do this. Well, how did Cyrus get to know about these Jewish writings? Josephus tells us quite bluntly that Cyrus was shown the remarkable prophecy of Isaiah by Daniel. Remember Daniel's, he's number two man. How God organizes things. You know, it, it all seems to happen by chance. No, 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 there's no such thing as chance. I no longer believe in coincidence. I no longer believe in chance. It's God's hand on everything. friend of mine said to me not so long ago how would you describe providence in one word god's providence in one word and the answer is simple everything and he's not far wrong when you look back across your own life and the things that happen by chance you look back in retrospect god's hand is on it maybe even years before something happens you can see where God set it all in place and it's all in line and it happened. Daniel understood the 70 years prophesied by Jeremiah had ended. So the promise to return to the land was imminent. He pointed it out to Cyrus and Cyrus says, okay, you can go back, build a temple. And so, according to Ezra 2, which is essentially a, a census chapter, there were 49,897 Jews who left Persia under the leadership. leadership. I've got to be careful with my enunciation, haven't I? Under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua. It's also of note that there's a Mordecai mentioned in the leadership with Zerubbabel and Joshua. Whether that's the Mordecai of Esther, Esther or not, we don't know. But there was someone called Mordecai who went back as well. And as I said earlier, the actual length of Ezra uh, of the exile was 51 years from the third conquest. And that explains why, as we're told a little later, some of the old men wept when they saw the temple that was being built and compared it to the glory of the temple of Solomon. 
they were in their seventies. They'd seen the temple of Solomon and this one just didn't match up, but it was a temple. The ones who'd never seen the temple of Solomon, they shouted for joy while the others were weepy because it wasn't as glorious. And the scripture tells us the sound was heard throughout Israel. And it was difficult to tell the difference between those who were shouting for joy and those who were weeping. I won't read all of Jeremiah. I'll get, I suppose, I'm running out of time a bit. Don't worry, I've only got 51 pages of notes. That's, that's fine. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14, tells us, For thus says the Lord, After 70 years are completed to Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. We quite often hear that quoted out of context. Not to say that it's not true, but just in conquest, in its context, it relates to Israel. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Well, in a sense, that's as true for us today as it was then. Anyone who becomes conscious of his need senses the satisfying gift of God and sets out to find him can be sure of victory if you seek with a whole heart. Cleansing, peace, joy, victory are there at the hand of a loving God who delights to welcome his children home. Where am I up to? According to Ezra 2, yes, that's that one. Okay, well, how about Zerubbabel? What was he like as a man? Well, we haven't been told too much about him other than an important point. He's the grandson of Jehoiachin, the last of the kings who was taken to Babylon. Zedekiah and all of those, he, he died over there, but all his sons were put to death in front of him before his eyes were put out. But Jehoiachin was taken there earlier. So now we have his grandson. The royal Davidic line is unbroken. And he was appointed governor of the Jews by Cyrus, but not governor of the province. Under the Persian rulers, the Jews were well treated and they were held in high regard. And the idea was to attach them to the Persian Empire by gratitude, not by force and fear. Although they remained as a vassal state of the Persians, the Persians wanted them there in gratitude for what had been done for them, not by force and fear as the Babylonians had. The temple treasures were restored to the custody of the Jews and those who didn't return encouraged those who were returning by their gifts. You can read about that in Ezra 1 verses 5 to 11. In Ezra 3 verses 1 to 7, in the seventh month, which was the beginning of the civil year, the repatriated Jews gathered at Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a long time since they've celebrated one of their feasts. Now they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles under the leadership of Joshua, or was Yeshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel. They built an order, altar, and they offered burnt offerings according to the law. They felt 
that by honoring Jehovah, he would protect them from their enemies. Then they moved ahead with preparations for building the temple, using help from Tyre and Sidon. <clears throat> the actual construction, excuse me, <clears throat> the actual construction began 14 months after the return. And as soon as the foundation was laid, the priests and the Levites led in a service of dedication. So I mentioned many of the old men who had seen the glory of the temple of uh, Solomon, they wept. And you can read about that in Haggai chapter 2, verse 3. But Haggai 2, verses 1 to 9, <clears throat> has an interesting comment. <clears throat> In the seventh month, in the seventh month, I don't want that one yet. On the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. It moves from a prophecy for Zerubbabel and Joshua into a prophecy of the last days. Can you see that? Once more, it is a little while, and it has been a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I'll shake all nations. Read Revelation. That's what he's talking about. Now, the actual construction... Have I gone backwards, have I? I have to press the wrong button. Now, there was opposition to the building of the temple. And they certainly had a good go at that. Oh, dear. Too much. <clears throat> anyway, in chapter 4, we get the division, uh, the opposition. Rahum the commander and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes. And there's a lot of ites and tights there. And they all complain about the Jews. They're rebuilding. If you check your records, King, you'll find that this is a rebellious mob. that they really, you shouldn't allow this. Anyway, they sent that off to Artaxerxes with that sort of a threat in it. Now, who were this lot? The adversaries of Judah and Benjamin mentioned in verse 1 were descendants of colonists from other countries. 
who'd been planted in the land when Assyria took the northern kingdom into captivity. These colonists had intermarried with the Jews who remained in the land and their offspring became known as Samaritans. Now that's where the Samaritans come from. They came to Zerubbabel, pretended they wanted to assist in the rebuilding of the temple. They said they too worshipped Jehovah, but he was only one of many gods in their idolatrous system of religion. And so the leaders of Israel refused the offer. The Samaritans then changed their tactics. First, they tried to discourage the people of Judah. Then they troubled them, came up and annoyed them. Then they hired counselors to lobby against Israel at the royal court to frustrate the Jews through the use of scare tactics. Now, the enemies of Judah did succeed in having work on the temple stopped until the second year of Darius's reign. And that frustration lasted from the second year of Cyrus to the second year of Darius, a time frame of about 14 years. And I think that's where we might leave it for today. Father, we thank you that as we go through this and we can see your faithfulness, your hand upon everything that happens and your faithfulness, Lord. And we thank you that your faithfulness doesn't change because you don't change. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. We thank you that the faithful, you're faithful to the promises that you've made and you're faithful to the prophecies that are in your word and you fulfill them to the very last minute detail. And Lord, we look forward to your return. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.